I grew up on an island where everybody was white. My school was mostly white. And so, so I had the simultaneous problem of being attracted to white guys growing up and also wanting to be them mm-hmm. um, because I, I felt so different and I felt so ugly. And I feel like, you know, Agatha in the School for Good and Evil in the books can't look at mirrors. Mm. She feels ugly. She feels like a witch. She feels outside of everyone. She she just thinks that she's the ugliest person in the world. And that was me. I mean, 100%. Mm. And I think it's a slow process of unbrainwashing yourself from that. Today on Quitters, we are interviewing Soman Chinani, author of The School for Good and Evil. And he was fascinating. Yeah, he was. He was really smart. He has interrogated his own mind to the nth power. Like he, I feel like 95% of the questions we asked him, he's already asked himself a million times. I agree. I totally agree. Did it make you feel, I mean, we never really talk about what it does to us, but I felt like unrealized as a human after talking to him. (laughs) Like I want to go meditate somewhere for a long time. I felt like I was, I felt like someone to look up to. He's an author and, and a, you know, he makes his movies come out of his books and all this stuff. And he lives in New York. I was like, oh, this is someone to really look up to. He also, he's so, he, we were really peppering him with like different dimensions of questions. And he was so on balance without being rehearsed in his answers. I couldn't agree more. I thought he was a fascinating guy and he was so refreshingly Uh, or he felt that it was refreshing to answer questions about the things that he's quit and the stuff that he's left along the way rather than just focus on his current success, which is huge. He's hugely Mm -hmm. successful, but he had to quit a lot of stuff along the way. And it's fascinating to listen. Yeah, he was like humble without being um, unbelievably humble. He was he, like he was humble in a in an authentic way. I thought very authentic, so, very you, authentic. You will enjoy him. He was great. So stay tuned. I don't think we tune on podcasts, do we? So just don't hit off. <laughs> you say, like don't stop. Don't go to doing. Instagram. Don't go to Instagram, or if you do, or you can the volume. Yeah, just yeah. get the volume off, and you can scroll while you're listening to Solman Chinani. I'm Julie. This is Chad. You guys are both authors, which always intimidates the hell out of me. Uh, (laughs) Because it means you sat alone and did something for a really long time. We're all a bit mentally off. So if that's any any, uh, solace, (laughs) that in order to be an author requires a little bit of a screw loose. In what way in particular? I agree with you, by the way. I think it's the ability to entertain yourself by disconnecting from the world and surrounding yourself with figments of your own imagination. <laughs> you know, it is, but, it is, you know, shadow boxing a little bit. But mm. I mean, I can entertain myself, but I can't actually put it on. I can't do it and like have the discipline to put that on paper. Do you, are you creative faster than you're, than you write? I think of it more as I'm not in control of it. Like, it just sort of, it's its like being possessed. Do you know what I mean? Where if I even try to take a certain day off when I'm in the flow of things or like, I can feel my whole body revolting. It almost won't let me go about, like, I can't take that sort of random vacation day without there actually being like this weird, like subconscious price. How long has it been that way for you since since you learned how to write? I think since I since I actually started like writing creatively for a living, you know? I had a weird career in that I started by running as far away from writing as I could. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I knew it was my gift. I had a seventh grade English teacher who was very clear to me where she was like, you will not be able to do anything else in your life uh, as well as you, as well as you write. She might have been a witch. It was the opposite of, you know how most teachers, you hear stories of teachers kind of discouraging people from following their dreams, you know? This was the opposite. She was very, very clear. And later, in fact, uh, the only book I really dedicated in the series was to her. And she, uh, the Lady Lesso character in the, in the School for Good and Evil movie that Charlize Theron plays yes. is her, is 100% her. Oh, like down cool. to the long nails, down to the way she dresses, everything. You know, She told me, she goes, you're going to be a writer. But I grew up in an Indian family where 
that's not an option. I was dealing with being gay in the closet. It felt like there were too many things. And the thing that I had to sort of like throw away was the artist part of me. So yeah. when so that was at a time when you were going to school for, I mean, what did you think? I know you went to film school. Later. So that was, oh, okay. this was, so before yeah, that. going to film school was sort of the, the genesis of me having my nervous breakdown. Before that, I went to, um, you know, I went to Harvard and I, I, luckily, because it's a very liberal arts education, like there is no way to major in business or anything like that. So I gave myself the grace of majoring in English, you know, uh-huh. telling myself that ultimately I would be a lawyer, doctor, businessman, whatever it was right. going to be. But for these four years, I would enjoy myself. And then I came out and became a pharmaceutical consultant. Wait, what? How did that happen? <laughs> uh, because Harvard, <laughs> d- back then at least, there were no other, they sent all the recruiters to campus, you know? Yeah. And you just became nervous. How else were you going to get a job? You would just go to these recruiting sessions. And there was a consulting firm that that believed that if you got like really good communicators out of the English department or whatever, they would be good in pharmaceuticals where everything is about language. Everything is about communication. Um, and I got suckered in with, you know, the promise of a uh, high payday and golden handcuffs. And there I was like, you know, being a pharmaceutical consultant. And from day one, my body was in pure 100% revolt, like mm. absolute, absolute revolt. Mm. Um, and I lasted, somehow I lasted a year and a half. I don't know how I made it those 18 months, but I think I was physically and mentally ill for all 18 months until finally they fired me. You know. They, oh, they fired you. Thank God they did because I wouldn't have left. You know, I didn't have the courage to leave. And they were like, you literally are sitting in the corner every chance you get reading a novel or working on a screenplay. <laughs> what company was this? It was called Cats and Back Partners at the time. It was an offshoot of McKinsey and it then got uh. bought, you know, by PwC or something like that. But, you know, it was Pfizer was our client. And this is coming from someone who to this day has maybe taken an Advil twice and otherwise <laughs> never takes anything ever. You know, when you go against your soul and do something that you you just don't believe in, bad yes. things happen. Um, and that was, luckily, I was only 23 when I got fired. And I think that was the beginning of, of the internal revolution, I think. Did you have to then learn how to be creative again? I had a nervous breakdown is what happened. I basically did something really interesting, which I almost think everyone should do at some point in their life, where I basically shut off all stimulus. I did what people do when they have a concussion, which is sort of dark room therapy, Mm -hmm. where I didn't open the TV, didn't look at the internet, didn't look at email, didn't look at my phone. Back then, there were no smartphones because it was 2003, 2004, for 11 months. And I would just walk around Manhattan. 11 months. And I would walk around Manhattan and I basically disappeared from the world and basically said no no more input. I don't want any more input. I just want to, I want to sort of like rewire the output. You know what I mean? Like I just wanted to, to deal with what was there. What and led to, to that? I love always oh, finding out with the moment yeah. before when you were like, this is the decision I'm making. What were you leaving behind? Quitting, if you will. I think when I, when I got fired from that job, I remember sort of sitting in like, you know, it was 2004 or something like that, sitting in a dark room and telling myself that like life had somehow gotten off track. I sort of felt like, okay, for the first time, like I'm not a high achiever. I went from valedictorian of my high school to literally first or second of my class at Harvard to the, you know, sort of the golden boy of the family to now getting fired for my first job, having no money, no income, all that stuff. And having to be like, okay, clearly this is, this didn't work out, you know? And I think in that moment, I felt something inside me say, you're no longer in control of this ship. There's another part of you that is going to be in control of this ship. And we're not, that part is protesting until you give it control. Who's saying that to you inside your own head? Like what part of you is, is, is speaking those words? The creative elves, the ones that, the, the same ones that write the books. Yeah. It was that. It was, it, it's, I, at the time I remember thinking of it as, it felt like a little silver ball of light. Like mm. anytime I would sort of like sit in the dark, I could feel this like, it looked a lot like this microphone and it felt like <laughs> if I could see it and it was like this thing inside me that was like, 
we know how to do this. We know how to get you out of this. Because at the same time, I was suffering from severe depression, anxiety, even OCD. Because when you have so much creativity, and anytime I meet somebody who's like a soft spirit, who's who I think is creative and is and is suffering from like a lot of these things, mm. I almost can feel it that it's because their their creative self, their unlived self is being caged somewhere. And that's gonna cause everything to, you know, all those all the stuff that needs to come out is trapped. You mm. have a real connection to your bo- mind body. I mean, you keep saying. You say that your body would rebel against you taking a day Mm. off if you're in the flow and that your body was like, wouldn't let you be a pharmaceutical sales rep. Can you tell us where that comes from? Was that a practice that started early in your life or just something you became aware of later on? There was kind of a violence if I was on the wrong track. Like I just felt like physically stuff would happen or I wasn't, you know, like I couldn't, uh, the, the direction would change like on its own, you know, like I wasn't in control. Like I would, uh, if I tried to control things in the wrong direction, something would stop me. And it only took, it took many years to over time learn to make that work in my favor. And it came by, by accepting that, you know, the, the creative spirit has its own way of doing things. You can't control it from a conscious space. And that's later on, I got into meditation and all those things that helped me kind of harness it. But at the time, um, when I didn't have all those tools, it just felt like this, this internal rebellion. Is it different from an impulse? Yes, because this is very physical and, and you like, I'll put it this way. So when I was at the pharmaceutical consulting firm, the way I got fired was the last two weeks, I wore the same shirt every day. I didn't shave. I didn't, I wore the same shirt every day for two weeks. I didn't shave. I like, I basically like, which is so crazy, right? Because you're talking to somebody whose like entire life was predicated on making people feel like he was doing a good job. Like, yeah. And you know how people talk about silent quitting, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was doing that, but I wasn't in control of it. I like, I would wake up, put on the same shirt, and I'm like, what am I doing? Like, <laughs> but I was, I had lost control of it. And yes. I think. There's something inside me where the creative source is so strong that when it feels like it has to, it takes absolute control of me and I don't have power over it, you know? And it makes sense because I'm writing books. You know, the books I write have 180 characters and like 70, like it's basically trying to write game of, like the Game of Thrones world is in you and it's not expressing itself. Of course, it's going to hijack you, you know? Man, holy shit. That is absolutely fascinating. But, so back in college, when you were able to be an English major, mm. did you feel either uh, a that that dissonance, where mm. or did you or were you aware of the silver the silver ball of creativity, or were you just sort of in a in a in a kind of a stasis that was a pleasant stasis, and you weren't aware that you needed to do anything different? I think then I was in turmoil between the fact that I knew I loved words and language and stories and all that stuff and also not knowing what to do with my future. And I was also in the closet. So I felt like there were, there were, there was a lot of sort of places where I was hiding myself, you know, and at least in a book I could get lost, you know? Yeah. Um, Yeah. But I think it was still, it was still this belief that you know, I was going to come out of school and go to business school and become a businessman, you know? So I, yeah. I, I think that's still where I was headed, unfortunately. And now a word from our sponsors. So, you know what I was just doing? I was just moving my son Oliver's bed down to, um, uh, I've got a pool house that I'm turning into. I know, these are luxury problems. I'm <laughs> turning into a guest house and... I had to move it and then I had to move the bed again. I had to change everything because he doesn't like the mattress I got him for his room. He wants a sattva. He goes, I would like what's on your bed, mom. And I was like, well, what about this thing that came squished up in a box? And he said, no, thank you. So I went down to the guest house and you know what? Everybody's tried my sattva now and they all want a sattva mattress. Wow. So the boys are allowed to take naps on your bed and stuff. They're allowed in your room. 
We used to have, oh yeah, we used to have puppy piles on Friday night when Aww. they were little. We would all sleep in one bed on Friday nights, and that was when they were little. Now they are young men. But um, he came in the other day. I was quizzing him on something, and he lay down on the bed, and I was I was like walking around, folding things, and quizzing him. And uh, he's like, Mom, this mattress is good. I like this mattress. Can I get this mattress for my room? Because I got him a bigger bed. And I was like, uh, yeah, sure. And I tried to, I tried to trick him. Didn't work. Didn't work. <laughs> Just get a sadfa. Just go. Well, we only have <laughs> one bed in this house, and uh, Penny, our dog, is not allowed to get on it, but we're mm. allowed to get on it, and we love mm. it because it has a sadfa mattress on it. Do you know? It, do you suspect that Penny looks at her dog bed and then looks at you and looks at the dog bed, and she's like, "Can I get a sadfa?" <laughs> <laughs> I do suspect that. Yes, I do. I love my Sadfa mattress. My kids love my Sadfa mattress. And the thing is, right now, you can get $200 off your purchase of $1,000 or more at Sadfa.com forward slash quitters. That's S-A-A-T-V-A dot com slash quitters. For those who are only listening, your background is very much in order. Uh, as I can see it from here. And also your clothes and your physical appearance are very much in order. As someone who like has control over a world of 180 characters, are you ever at odds with the lack of control that you have in the real world? I meet a lot of writers who have their, you've seen them with their walls covered in post-its. Yes, yes. And they have their filing cabinet and all that stuff and their outlines and everything. I have none of it. Right. I don't have a single outline. I don't have a single note for mm. all 4,000 pages of the School for Good and Evil. I don't have anything. So, like, if there was ever like an archive or something, there's nothing to put in it. And it all just comes from the fact that I, I think I've learned to trust that my conscious brain can't put together as complicated a fantasy world as my unconscious can. And so there has to be complete surrender to it. Did you have that like faith in the process? Before all, you know, such validation came. No, no, no. So the first book I had a, I had a hundred page outline for. So I was going to write a four hundred page book, and I had a hundred page outline outlining every step of every detail of what I was going to do. Because obviously, I didn't know how to write a novel, and and I felt like everything had to be planned out and everything had to be perfect. And about six chapters in, uh, it's a chapter called Wish Fish, which is now one of the you know most popular scenes in the series and a big scene in the movie. And I thought my brain had this idea. And I was like, you can't go off the outline. Like, how can you go off the outline? <laughs> and like, but like, I just felt like I had to go in this direction. But if I went in that direction, it would completely screw the next like 50 pages the of the whole video. outline just done. Mm. And I could feel that rebellion again, that internal, that internal things really like fighting with me. And for the first time ever, I think after a few days of fighting it and trying to ignore it, I realized. You're gonna lose. You're gonna lose this fight again. You know what I mean? Like I, I recognized it. I, it happened enough times in my life in the past few years to know that I had to chase it. So I wrote that chapter, and I think that was the beginning of understanding that that the outline, the the way of the outline, the years of the outline were short lived. There was gonna be a new way to write, uh, and I did books two through six with no outline, and I and. I mean, these are insanely complicated books with their detective stories with like, you know, whodunits and all that stuff. And I just, I kind of surrender to it and it always works out in the end, you know? Mm. Do you feel that you don't take credit in a way for your writing? It's as if you're mm. channeling it. Yeah. Is that a way um, of being modest? Is it a way of of not... I know I was raised to never brag. Like you never yeah, talk yeah, yeah. about it. So th in a way, even though you're doing incredibly hard work, you're sort of attributing it to something outside of yourself. Is that come from your your upbringing? I don't think so because I have a big ego. So I feel like I would have... <laughs> okay, honest. <laughs> I would happily, happily take credit for it if I, if I thought it was the truth. No, no, no. But the, to be serious, I think... Yeah, it was funny because Madonna, five or six years ago, she had this really cool interview where she was like, the only way to have longevity and to, to really produce the same level of work again and again and again is to understand that you're actually not the creator, you're the manager. So mm -hmm. uh -huh. as long as you're the manager who's showing up and, and marshalling the creative elves, everything's going to be fine. But you're not the creative elves. And I feel like 
I huh. believe that heart and soul, which is why I think sometimes it's funny because I can I can look at a book and be like, oh man, that was so good. Like I can have this like deep appreciation and feeling for it because it doesn't feel like I wrote it. It feels like I managed it. I was the agent on it, but otherwise, like where stuff comes from, all of that feels like such a mystery. I, you know, I I sit down to write and I I don't know how things are going to go. Every day feels like, you know, sort of a weird adventure, you know? Are you able to trust other people then as stewards of management? Like, do you have a good relationship with editors and, you know, execs at film studios? Well, those are two different things. I think with editor, with the editor-author relationship, I'm lucky that I've had the same editor. You know, she's been at HarperCollins for 45 years. She was Maurice Sendak's editor. She's just, oh my God. she's this battle dragon at wow. uh, HarperCollins named Tony Marquis. She is just mm. the ultimate. And, you know, in the beginning, she used to make the mistake of asking me, well, where is this going? And I'm like, I don't know. Don't ask me that question because I have mm-hmm. no clue. I can't tell you what's going to happen. Wait, and- how did you end up with an editor when you still weren't sure where it was going, is after your, you must have turned in a completed first novel. Oh, no, no, no. So that, what I use, mm-hmm. yeah, so what I do is I okay. turn it in in pieces. I don't give her the whole book. Got it. So I'll turn Got it, it in. What I, what I like to do with Tony is I'll turn in maybe a third of the book. Yeah. Just because I feel like if it's, if it seems like it's going way off track or there's something off, I want to know that. Because then that means like, you know, and it usually doesn't happen. I don't think it, it really hasn't happened before, but I'd like just the assurance of her being like, okay, I get, I get the first act. I know what tension you're setting up. I know what's happening. So I'd rather not turn in a whole book altogether. But uh, she's just fantastic in that she asks a lot of questions. She's constantly poking around at the material, making sure that it just holds up, you know, that every, because with fantasy, you can't have any holes. It's like when you watch House of Dragon on, Mm-hmm. TV and you're like, like you'll just sort of like raise your eyebrows, like oh, um, you wonder, you wonder, you're wondering why um, some of the children have brown hair and it doesn't <laughs> really make any sense because it <laughs> genetically there is no through line here. Yeah, I've spent a lot of 100%. time on Reddit on that one. <laughs> that kind of stuff. So you know, she's there to ask those ask those questions. Film is different. Film is different because you know you're dealing with executives, you're dealing with a much more collaborative process. And there, I don't think you can be as free in the creative. It's not, novel writing is different. Writing Novel writing is much more of a uh, deep dive into your unconscious. I think screenwriting is more scientific. And so and that's where you have to work in the world of outlines and, you know, figuring everything out ahead of time. I wanted to go back to your creative silver ball. I love that, mm. that, that metaphor at the time when you were struggling with it, when you hadn't sort of let it take over your life, your real mm. creative force, you were also in the closet, as you said. Yeah. Do you have a? Is there a similar ball or entity that represented who you were in your sexuality that didn't want to look at or you were pushing away? Did you feel it as as concretely as you did your creative abilities? It was such a hard thing, and I think to this day I haven't fully understood how I felt at that time in my life because being gay, people don't understand, is incredibly complicated because when you're growing up, you don't know if you like someone or whether you want to be them. And so there's Uh this like weird kind of, it's like, it's funny because I was talking to my trainer about this when he opens up TikTok, like it's just a lot of like, like, you know, hot women and he feels kind of overwhelmed. But then, you know, but for us, it's like, if you open it up and there's a lot of like, like good looking guys, you, it's like, are you like insecure? Like, it's just, it's different. You're attracted to a similar form. And it's a, it, mm-hmm. I find it incredibly disorienting when you're a teenager. And so I think I was struggling more with that, less with the attraction and more with the, uh, I was so underweight back then, you know, I think just because of anxiety, I just didn't eat much. I think I was six foot 118, you know? Mm. So, what? I know. I was such oh a supermodel. I I could have walked every runway if I was a, oh. a girl. You knew you were gay or did you not know you were gay? No, I knew. I knew. I just didn't know what to do about it. It was, you know, the same thing as as knowing you're an artist, but that you have to be a businessman, right? You just resign yourself to these realities because back then there was no social media. There was nothing to mm-hmm. to help you. There was nothing to nothing to kind of no guy. What did you have? You had Ellen. 
But even that, you know, <laughs> that that wasn't helpful either because it just it just wasn't, you know. So it was uh, there was nothing to look at, and so you just kind of you you give up and you realize that you're just going to spend your whole life kind of being another person. And I think that's why it was interesting that the revolt had to be so violent to get my attention, because I think like a lot of people, it's very easy to just mm -hmm. your soul to give up and and be someone who you're not. You did. You unresigned from those realities. Mm. Are you feeling resigned to any realities now at this point in your life? No, it's so funny. I did a I did a school visit with um, some uh, 13-year-old kids uh, earlier this morning. And one of them asked the greatest question just out of the blue. Because, you know, the usual questions, what inspired your book and all that? And someone <laughs> goes, what does it feel like to be successful? Mm. And I just thought it was such an interesting question because... I think what happens is like when you do achieve success beyond what you ever think is possible or anything like that, it does completely relax that that inner anxiety desperate for validation to some extent, you know, on the on the sort of creative front. And I think it frees you up and I think it makes you more committed to being yourself, you know? So I think on that front, there is this desire now to to even invest even more deeply in who I am and what stories I have to tell and, you know, just sort of keep chasing that rabbit down a hole, you know, that I've been lucky enough to be able to, to relax and not have to hustle so hard, you know, for sort of external sort of markers of success, but to be able to, for whatever next world I'm going to create, sort of go in and do it purely from the heart. Is the author's name Buzz Bissinger? Can someone co-sign that? Is it Buzz? The guy who wrote Friday Night Lights. I was listening to him do an interview with Dan Levitard last week. And he was talking about how after Friday Night Lights came out. And he's like, he was probably like 34, 35. Yeah. And what he felt was, you know, maybe a year into the wake of it was like such an intense pressure to try to live mm. up to the success of something yeah. great that he had yeah. done. But you don't feel that is what you're, is what sounds I like feel the saying. complete utter opposite because I think <sighs> that's pretty cool. In this case, look, that's very yeah, cool, I think but it's unusual. Yeah. I think it's what it is, is the understanding that I think I did six books that I loved and put my heart and soul and everything into mm. in a way that during that time was a little bit unbalanced. Like my life revolved around those books. I was writing a 600, 700 page book every year. You know what I mean? Like that was just, that's what I did. You know, I couldn't have a relationship really that was successful during that time and all those sorts of things. And then had this bonus of this movie come out and it felt like I did it. I did it. You know, like I, I put in the work, I did everything I could and like had a result that I was happy with. But now I don't feel the pressure to do it again because I think you only get one of those in a lifetime. Mm. Um, like that, like to try to do it again, like that seems insane. So you like, don't, you're not measuring future success against past success. You just, I'm whatever not, happens next, it happens next. The success on this one was a, a little too big and unexpected to be able to, to use that as a measuring stick. It's not fair, uh -huh. you know, it's, it's not, it's just, it's, huh? I don't. I mean, maybe the world That's will. So I cool, think, man. You're like, my That's shit incredible. was so fired was that I could, no charts. one could ever. Man. That's pretty awesome, Not man. Even. I don't know. That's I don't awesome. know. I just, I I gave up on on that. I think maybe also like I've spent the last, you know, eight, 10 years getting deeper into to sort of just internal work and things like that and understanding that your life is short, you know, mm. like it it goes fast and then you're gone and if you spend your whole life chasing the external markers, then what are you doing? Like to me, like the, the joy will be with the next thing mm -hmm. and understanding that I don't have that pressure anymore. That's like very, um, almost like radical, a point of view of yours. And again, for people who are only listening, like you really look like you mean it. And mm -hmm. it's like, I, I think there's this idea that writers especially have to be a misery to be good at the job. Like it's almost like a, it feels like sometimes a character that people play out as mm. authors and as writers. Did you never feel like that was something you had to play into? Or, or did you always feel like, I'm just going to do this as myself? I think I was always tortured during those first six books because 
I think I felt the pressure during those first six books because the fan base was growing and it was getting more global. And each book I was feeling more and more pressure on. And so I, I think I went through it enough where, you know, could I bring it, like the six books occur in sequence. Could I handle that many characters? Could I bring it to a successful conclusion? And when I did, I just felt like, you know, that's, that was a 10 year journey. Wow. So that six was a 10 year journey. So it, that's insane. It was, yeah. It was, Wait. you know, it was, I don't know if, or less than that. Cause really I started, so about six books in eight years, you know? So I just feel like wow, that was enough for, for me, you know, and I'll try, I'll try again. I'll do an, I'll build another world. I'll try another series. I'll do, do all of it. But, uh, I don't think I'll allow myself to feel that same pressure again. I love reading about how writers write. I mean, some of them like mm. you sit down every morning for four hours. Doesn't matter if it's good or bad. You might throw away all the pages. They've yeah. got some sort of system or craft to it. And uh, others are more like you. And it's just this all-consuming creative force that sort of mm. takes them over. But then if you're waiting for that, are you also in danger of being, you know, the next Fran Leibowitz? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny because I, what's funny is Fran Lebo, which is such an interesting case because I yeah. love her and I've read her books and everything like that. I listen to her talk and, she, you know, if she ever hears this, she'll get mad. But <laughs> I feel like she is a better talker than she is a writer. She's a really the best talker. Like, so maybe ever that's what it was history. all for. Right? Yeah, I think that's what it was meant. I think it all worked out exactly right, which is wow. to be the. To be the writer, to be the speaker who talks about not writing is, is that's her. She's doing exactly yeah. what she should be doing. I think in my case, I have worlds that I've been thinking, like I would never write a book that I haven't been thinking about for a few years. It's kind of, it's weird. Like, it's funny. The only person I've heard who, who has a similar um, system to me is Tarantino, where he says he had his ideas for his 10, eight, 10 movies. 10 movies, Basically yeah. from the beginning. Yeah, he's had them from the beginning. And he basically has to kind of be pregnant for with an idea for a long time. I've been the same way. Like every idea that I like, be some beauty, and then I, I wrote a novella called The Princess Game, and obviously the School for Geneva books. I had those ideas for years, and I feel like I need them need to have them for years because then I know that they're not wedded to a moment. Like they mm-hmm. they mm-hmm. exist beyond the political cycle. They exist beyond whether I'm angry at some something or someone or you know what I mean like I need to have it for at least two or three years and so I have a couple a couple worlds that I would like to explore and investigate and you know uh see if it works out but I I I do have them planned the question is sometimes I had a you know sometimes you start working on it and you realize it just doesn't work right that's I was gonna uh, say do you have ideas that you get unpregnant with Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I had a great idea for um, this kind of sci-fi series after the first three books of School for Good Evil, and I was working on it, and something just didn't seem right about it. You know, after about a year of working on it, and you just have to accept that it wasn't it wasn't meant to be at that after time. After a year, you know? so after a year. Okay, wait, this is fascinating because that means that you you literally, and again, just the name of the show is Quitters. Like you had output for a year, mm. and you chose to walk away from it. Walk me through that process. Is it, have you yeah. reread it 15 times? Have you given it to an editor? Have you just stayed awake thinking about it? But what's the moment when you go, I guess it's not going anymore? I think it was that I was going to do um, a, a companion book to School for Good Evil, kind of like a fun illustrated handbook. And I knew I had to put this thing aside for a few months, mm-hmm. you know? So I was working on it and I was really excited about it and I finished the first part, but there was something in me that was just like, I, I was never really, like every day when I was going back to it, I didn't feel that same buzz mm. of like, like people are going to love this, you know, mm-hmm. or like, I, I, I love this. Like I just felt something was a little off. And so I was working on this handbook and little by little every day, I could feel part of me start to feel it being like, this doesn't work. Mm. Like, if it, like there's something about this that feels forced and sort of generated mm-hmm. rather than made by the world. It felt like like put together by me. And yeah. it happens sometimes. You'll see second movies by people who made incredible first movies. Yeah. And you feel like that second movie is a little bit like, like forced uh, to in there. And it doesn't feel like organic. And I think that's what it was. It didn't feel like it had... There was something in it that was off. And you just decided how many pages of output did you have? How many hours had you put into this when you go? Oh, God. 
It's done. It it didn't seem like a difficult decision at the time, though. I think it felt like it just wasn't good enough. And I think that it's, well, I will say this. I think the one thing I've always had for myself that has always helped me is that because I'm so hard on myself and I have such a clear vision for what I want to achieve ultimately, I don't care about people's reactions to my work Mm. as much as I care about fulfilling the thing. Like What's I care thing? about like, did what is I, the thing? yeah, like the thing is like, did I hit the vision? Did I make it look, did, does it read the way I wanted it to read? Does it give me the feeling I want to give? And I feel like if it does that, I'm happy. And so I'm less interested in what the audience will think of it and things like that. Cause I know if I, if I get there for myself, the audience will take care of itself. But in this case, it wasn't hitting that thing for me. So it felt like, how can I put something out that I don't think is, is it, you know? Your first giant break, and I keep looking at the dossier to make sure I get this right. I'm reading oh, yeah. here like that the movie deal was enough for him to not work for like 15 years. Um, and there, there's all these other signals of like how awesome it was, like how many people bought it, how many famous people started getting involved yeah. with it. Like, was there a tipping point moment where you realized, oh, wow, like this is really big. Like this is really about to be a, a dream come true. Uh, I mean, we sold the movie the the week the first book came out. And so I was in the middle of writing the second. And so, and I was still tutoring. That's the other crazy part. Mm-hmm. I, went, I didn't have money at that point, right? Because I had been fired from that pharmaceutical job and all that stuff. I was coming out of film school with a quarter million dollars debt. So I was tutoring um, kids for the SAT uh, six to seven hours a day, oh seven my days God. a week. And writing. And I was... And I was writing during the day. So I was working on the book during the day, kind of as a spec project, yeah. you know, like, cause I didn't know if that was going to go anywhere, but tutoring was my job. Even after the movie deal, I kept tutoring. I tutored all the way through book three. Cause I, I was, love it. I think I was afraid to let go of it because the fact that I had the money coming in from tutoring meant that the, I could do whatever I wanted with yeah. the book. Like yeah. the book was mine. Like I could publish it and you could all hate it. Not my problem. I have tutoring money. Do you know what I mean? Like, so what happened so after book three? It felt like the books were getting longer. They were starting yeah. to get to 700 pages. Yeah. And it felt like <laughs> there came a time where I f- physically was falling apart. I think I physically couldn't. I just, it was time to to take care of myself, you know, a little more. And I just had to make that that choice. It sounds like it all is coming from your body. Like your body seems to have a really great handle on on what your path should be. Yes, but it doesn't, it, it tells me in very sort of annoying, irritatingly aggressive ways. Mm-hmm. I wish it was, I wish it was more gentle. And it was just like, <laughs> it would pop into my head, but it's just not the way it goes, you know? But I think to me, because it was such a hard road with coming out of the closet and the job and all that stuff, when it came to writing, I think ultimately it felt like I was going to, I wasn't going to do it for the audience. I wasn't going to get lost in all that stuff. I was old enough and wise enough to, to make sure that what I was putting out was something I loved because these books were going to live for a long time on the shelf. And as long as I cared about it, you know, and I think that's maybe where the pressure came from as the audience got bigger and bigger. But it's interesting because the movie's out now. Yeah, and And it's fantastic. Yeah, and I think like, what's funny is a lot of people are like, oh, do you look at the reviews? Like, da 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 like, what do you... And to me, like, it's funny because maybe I'm just, in denial or something. But I feel like because I wrote the books and the books are my version, that's everything I have to say. I don't have an attachment to Mm -hmm. the movie or or how people feel about it. Or, I mean, I want them to like it, obviously the story and things like that. But to me, like the movie is a different thing made by the the film team and all that Mm -hmm. sort of stuff. The books were my version. You know, so you wouldn't um, feel like uh, I know Stephen King famously gets really his his feathers ruffled when he doesn't like the movies, and mm-hmm. like you don't feel like you would feel your baby was somehow bastardized if it weren't if the movie were not strong. I would, I would definitely have a. I, I think I would turn into Stephen King. I would be a nightmare, but I don't. I don't think I allow it to get to that point because I do insert myself pretty aggressively all along to make sure that. I can't control everything of 100%. Right. Like I don't control casting. I don't control the way things look. I don't control a million things in that movie. But it was a it was a nine-year development process where I had my hands on the script enough times where I was able to at least thematically keep it on track, you know, mm-hmm. so that it didn't end up like, sometimes you see these adaptations and you're like, this, what is this, you know? 
mm-hmm. where this felt like by the time you know Paul Feig picked it up, the script was in such a such a sort of solid place thematically that then you're able to just be like, mm. okay, here's a great filmmaker. Like, I want to see a Paul Feig movie. Go make something great with the, the understanding that at the very least, the story's in the right place. And that at that point, you can let go. You can let go. Yeah. Um, are you a- ever able to recreate the feeling of the flow state of writing in any other areas of your life? Like anything? Food? Yes. So it's funny. It's <laughs> such a good question. Because um, my secret is I play tennis five days a week. Uh, and I've been playing since I was a kid. So basically like, you know, college level tennis. And every day I use that hour of tennis to try to get into the flow state. It's almost oh, like wow. a hour meditation where I'm trying to like, Tiger Woods used to do it to himself. I think it's a yeah, underreported yeah. aspect of him. He used to hypnotize himself on yeah. the mm-hmm. golf course. And I try to do the same thing during tennis because if I can do it in that hour, I know that it's going to carry over to writing. So That's tennis is cool. me attempting to kind of disconnect from myself and let another part of myself take over. And I maybe achieve it two out of five days, <laughs> maybe one out of five days, uh-huh. but I'm trying every day. It's my hour to try to get there. And so you're talking about actually achieving a flow state while playing tennis. 100%. So yeah. there's, Where, and what does that tell me as someone who, um, every time a ball is hit towards me, I duck. What <laughs> is it like to be in that flow state in doing a sport? It's a it's a crazy experience because if you're not in there, which is most of the time. That, me all the time. <laughs> uh, it's a, a hundred. And look, I've been playing tennis for almost 35 years and I, it's hard to get there. Yeah. And when you're in it, like if you're not in there, every ball that comes, you're like, what do I do with this ball? Oh shit, that ball's far from me. Like right. you f- you'll feel your conscious brain reacting to everything. Yeah. When you're in the flow state, decisions are happening for you that you are surprised oh. by consistently. Where you're like, oh wow, I'm hitting it there? Interesting. Why am I hitting it there? Oh, I get it. Like it's like everything's ahead of you. You're like, you're uh, just yeah. sort of like, it's like one step, you know. And to me, I was a big Roger Federer. Uh-huh. Like he uh-huh. was my favorite. And I was also a huge Serena Williams fan because yeah. both of them were flow state athletes where when Roger and Serena are not in flow, they are actually pretty bad. Yeah. At tennis. Like you, mm. you see Serena and Roger when they're off or they're nervous and like they can lose to everybody. And they're like angry. They just yeah. Uh, yeah. so off rhythm, such a mess. Yeah. And then Serena will like scream or do something to like, and it sort of just like, Again, hypnotizes herself into flow state and then forget it. You're gone. You know. Have you ever Roger actually too. tried to hypnotize yourself? The way no, that Tiger Woods a, does. Not in a not in a sort of like deliberate way. I used to do hypnotherapy when I was um, during that year of the nervous yeah. breakdown. Yeah. I used to to see a therapist that would sort of like put you under to see if you could get access to things. Uh huh. So I've you know I I sort of dabbled around in that and then. I dabbled around in uh, psychedelics too, in terms of like um, ketamine therapy, where Mm -hmm. you go to a doctor and do ketamine infusions and things like that. Like I've tried different ways to kind of understand, to get outside my conscious self, Mm because I feel like that's sort of the secret to figuring out who you really are, you know? Do you feel like your conscious self then is like the enemy? I think the conscious self is a very limited version of yourself. It's I, to me, I think of my conscious self as an attempt to control unknowable elements of life, and mm. it doesn't have very many answers. It's working mm. purely out of memory and the past, and it doesn't actually have access to true intelligence. Does that sound very woo-woo? No, it sounds fantastic. I think it sounds you fantastic. Know? I just wonder what you have to at what cost. Is this at what kind? I'm trying to imagine what your social life is like, or what your um, <laughs> what, what your family life is like, because it's very hard to stay that sort of pure as um, mm. to, as, as a as an instrument, as a vessel to sort of get you know to you're available to flow state. Yeah. How do you deal with the real world? You have to you have to create boundaries around it. So mm. you know, tennis is my hour to do it, and the writing hours are when I do it. And when I'm writing, I'm blocked off from the world in a lot of ways, you know. But otherwise, I let it go, and I'm not. I, I the rest of my life's like fully 
involved in the world and I'm not protective. Because the other thing is I'm not thinking about, because I'm so trusting of the flow state when I'm writing, I don't have to think about my work when I'm not working on it. I just feel like in the moment it's going to happen, right? Just like you don't think about the tennis match when you're not playing. As soon as you show up, you just have to make the right decisions and things. So I just feel like the rest of my life, I just try to relax and enjoy, you know, as long as those those flow state situations are protected. Because I don't think I, as long as, also the other thing is if you practice flow state in those two things consistently every day and also in meditation or whatever, Mm -hmm. then it slowly starts to come into the rest of your life where you are more present with your friends. You're more present in your relationships with your family. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not constantly reacting to past cycles and patterns and things like that. So you think that by practicing it, I had said earlier, and now I realize erroneously that you, without a structure or you know a craft to or to rely on, uh, then you're just relying on the muse to appear. But you actually have a structure to make the muse appear. You've that's you, it. It's a, that's it. Hundred percent. There's a great book also by um, Elizabeth Gilbert called Big Magic, where I think she's dancing around the same. I feel like it's the same thing, not articulated exactly in the same process, mm-hmm. but. It's the same idea, this idea that creativity is is a magic and you kind of have to, in order to make the magic happen, create these sort of practices and then mm-hmm. the magic sort of comes. But other, it's funny because it's hard to talk about. It's interesting that, that I actually today could articulate it to some degree, but with my friends and stuff, like they know not to ask about the writing. They know not to ask how a book is going or anything like that because I have nothing to tell them. You know, <laughs> I feel like there's nothing to say. It's I showed up today and something happened and I'll show up again tomorrow. That's all I can. That's all I can offer usually. Do your friends who have known you, you know, since you were, I guess, just before mm-hmm. you had major success, do they think you are magic? That's a good question. The ones who've known me for a really long time. They knew I was after something, you know, that there was some part of me that wasn't fully expressed. Mm. And I don't think they're particularly surprised in the sense that that at some point I was going to unleash some sort of big creative force. Whether or not people responded to it or it was successful, completely irrelevant. But I think they're not surprised that there's six books sitting on a shelf that (laughs) are set in a fantasy world. You know, that's I think I think there was always the feeling that that. There was the me in the real world, but there was an unlived life that needed to express itself creatively. Did that expression get easier after you were out of the closet? Yes. How were they they related? I, I think when you're in the closet you become so Mm self-conscious that you think that that's the way everybody is. Mm. Everything you say, you've rehearsed in your head. Mm. Every gesture you make is rehearsed. And you Mm. forget, and you don't know anything else. You don't know anything else. And so as you come out and it's a process, and this is where the meditation and trying to get me and all that stuff helps, you start to get glimpses of you just behave or you say things or you, Mm. you, you react in the present. And it's always, it still is a little surprising to me because I grew up spending my entire life deliberating, being in a constant state of such high tension that when I worked out with a trainer for two or three years after the third book to kind of like fix physically how I was feeling. And, and also I was still way underweight at that period. At one point, two years in, because I was always injured, things were always hurting. And, and he goes, it feels like you're in permanent startle response. He goes, because hmm. your shoulders are up, your tailbone is out, mm. and it feels like you're a cat in permanent sorrow st- response. And it was the most valuable thing anyone has ever said to me wow. because it was true. It was, it was true. And until he said it, I didn't realize it, which was that the trauma of everything up until I was 31 or however I was at that age had led me to completely lock up. You know, and I was wow. out of the closet, but I was still locked. You're carrying so, the trauma. 100%. In and, your body. How'd you get rid of and it? And that was it. It was a slow process, but the moment he said it, then your body hears it. And the next day you wake up and you feel your shoulders are here and you mm. feel your tailbone out and you feel it for the first time. And then little by little, little by little, you feel the tension in different places. You work on it. It, it just becomes a process. But once you're aware of it, you just need, I needed someone to tell me. I just needed some, I needed someone to tell me that, that the way I had lived my life for so long had caught me in these defensive patterns yeah. mm. that needed to be quit. 
You know, yeah. they like what the problem is sometimes you create these patterns to cope. Mm-hmm. Or you don't know you don't know how to get rid of them because right. you don't know what life is like without them. I like to think that I have my life pretty under control and I like it and I I have good friends and put me around my my parents and I'm a screaming 13 year old. Do you have people, places, or things that put you back in that state now? Absolutely. I mean, my <laughs> there's a reason <laughs> we that all everybody. Love our parents. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, mine are. You know, it's so funny because I just did an interview with the Wall Street Journal, and she was like, you know, I'm reading all your work and, and the mothers and all your your stories are so unmaternal <laughs> and have a slightly villainous quality. And I'm like, uh, oh. completely invented, <laughs> completely invented. No matter how much success you have. Uh, you still have to worry about whether or not you you say something about your parents that's going to hurt their feelings. Oh, absolutely. And you still like, you know, whenever you're around your parents, from I, unless you just are a unicorn, you do have the shoulders go up mm-hmm. and everything yeah. tighten up. It just, it just is the way it is. But if you recognize it, and I think that's been the key is to understand that when I'm, when I'm there in that situation, to feel the shoulders go up and to realize that most of the time you're reenacting the past. Mm-hmm. You literally have gone into zombie state where you're asleep mm-hmm. and you are now, re- and the more you can just sort of be like, okay, I literally went back to 1992. Right. So we are in 1992 right now. <laughs> like <laughs> the smartphone should not be here. Like as the moment you understand that, that you you've regressed, then usually you can snap yourself out of it. But it, look, that took, that took many, many years. You know, mm-hmm. I got, I got, uh, I got trapped down there for lockdown. For um, oh, down there. Where's down there? <laughs> uh, my in Miami, Florida, for five oh, or six months. Oh, okay. <sighs> you can, I, I literally, can you can see feel it. <laughs> I just saw it. It was like a whole different person just showed up. Like, <gasps> what was it? What was it what, what? like? Oh, it was tough. My mom's not one of those moms who enjoys having, you know, taking care of like having kids around all that stuff. So she didn't want me there, but I was stuck. I was there. I went down there on vacation just for three or four days and then everything happened. Could go back to New York. New York was on fire. So, you know, she didn't want me there. I didn't want to be there. It was, um, it was a really difficult situation, but luckily I had just finished the last book in the school for good evil. And it was, I was going to take a year off to go to a tennis academy in the south of France and oh. basically become a tennis hobo and like go around the world. I just wanted a year to like, you know, mess around. And instead, what I did was I wrote another book um, that was completely different from the series. But every feeling I had about those six months and being with there ended up in that book. And I think it's my favorite of all my books. It Which just book became, is that? It's called uh, Beast and Beauty. It's gonna. I'm just oh, about yeah. to do it as a t- TV show for um, for Sony, and it's this very sort of like they're dark fairy tales, and they're all about parents. Every story is about parents. And before we depart from like where you're from and and all those things, like I read a little bit about how you grew up. I am curious how how is your relationship with white people? Oh, that's a tricky question. <laughs> I think the issue is I grew up on an island where everybody was white. My school was mostly white. And so so I had the simultaneous problem of being attracted to white guys growing up and also wanting to be them mm-hmm. um, because I, I felt so different and I felt so ugly. And I feel like, you know, Agatha in the School for Good and Evil in the books can't look at mirrors. Mm. She feels ugly. She feels like a witch. She feels outside of everyone. She she just thinks that she's the ugliest person in the world. And that was me. I mean, 100%. Mm. And I think it's a slow process of unbrainwashing yourself from that because the problem is once you come out and get into the gay community, they prey on that fear in a lot of ways by mm. creating the image of what is the what is the right gay guy. It's white. It's muscular. It's someone who goes to the parties, does this, does X. Mm -hmm. You know, I want it out of the world where the Abercrombie, the Hollister, the you have to look a certain way and be a certain way in order to be to be accepted as a teenager and now to be gay too. It felt like the same thing over again. I Mm -hmm. to me it was just like the worst. I think that's what made it so hard to when I came out to understand like 
again, if the theme is quitting, I wanted to quit being gay in that world. <laughs> I wanted to, yeah. yeah. Like, and now, I just have you done a, that? Yeah, I never, the truth was I never, I mean, sure, I went to a few bars and tried to do the scene and go to a few things when I was in my early 20s. And I just hated it so much mm. that I was like, when I do meet a guy, it's going to be something different. And in the end, uh, you know, a year or so ago, I ended up meeting a goat farmer in St. Louis. Get the fuck was, out. Get the no. fuck out. A goat farmer. This is the, keep going. I'm sorry. This is he's, so he's, a, he's a goat farmer in St. Louis. He was in New York for one night. He made the mistake of liking me on Tinder. I don't even mm-hmm. use Tinder, but it tells me <laughs> if someone likes me. Right. And I opened it and I was like, this guy's interesting. And we just started talking on FaceTime. And again, if you are very aware and sort of pay attention to what your body's doing, like he lives far away. There was no reason for us to ever meet or right. anything because we didn't even meet when he was in New York. But I just felt like I kept getting pulled that way. But that was it. It was almost like it was just this understanding that my other half was going to be my complete opposite. He's a goat farmer who would like builds his own tractors. He's uh, He built his own house. He doesn't watch TV. He didn't know what Stranger Things was when <laughs> I asked him if he wanted to go to one of the, the, one no, of the, events, the events or something. Like, he just, he's just the complete and utter opposite. You know is what he, I mean? like is he, just he came, white and built? Is he Hollister and Abercrombie? Interestingly, he was in high school. And, ah. and when I saw his pictures of him in high school, when I finally went to his house and saw pictures of himself in high school, a therapist should unpack this. <laughs> I, had a, I had a panic attack. Right, you didn't mm. just you you couldn't be with this person, even though that person doesn't even exist anymore because he's not. Person, I had a total total panic attack. I went into the bathroom and was hyperventilating. Oh um, my he's god! Six foot, he's six foot six now. He's built like a. He's like six foot six, two thirty. He's just like a. He's like a. He's a big person. You know what I mean? Big he's guy. a big like yeah. big like, like solid a lumberjack. farmer. <laughs> yeah, but he was pure Abercrombie in high school, and so it was fascinating because I was like. Oh, in the end, I did end up with one of these people. But like, it just was such a strange, it's strange, you know, just strange how it, how it all turned out. As a follow-up to the question about your relationship with white people, you, you wanted to depart from like knowing and paying so much attention to what was desirable to them. It sounds, it sounds like, am I paraphrasing accurately? I wanted to be less brainwashed by archetypes. And the idea of like, you have to look like them. I, I didn't, I felt like I was privileging their opinion and not, not all white people. I mean, like that certain kind of, sure. like, you know, I feel like it was privileging their opinion, you know, first and foremost, I felt like I was exclusively dating them in my twenties too, trying to like get their validation and all that kind of stuff. And I think over time, it was an understanding that if I could, I could, stop seeing them as archetypes and start seeing the people the mm. way I saw everybody else. But there was something with them that was much harder. It took a, it took a much longer time. It's really hard to deprogram. That's like Very such hard. old thinking as evidenced by your panic attack. Yeah, I'm like, I'm, I'm very ham-fistedly trying to get to the theory, which is that like you learned so well what was desirable to white people or you saw them as... You, you at least, very least, you had to study them to survive around them, I, I would 100%, imagine. 100%. And like, 100%. does that in some way, has that helped you to make things in this country that are desirable to, among probably many people, like this gigantic white demographic that we live in? It's very, it's such an interesting question, which is that, you know, the protagonists of the School for Geneva are white, you know? And partially, there was the the sort of more pragmatic reason I did that was because at the time, you couldn't have books of that sort of scale and size with uh, protagonists of color. It just was a different era. Now you mm-hmm. can do it, but back then, it wouldn't have sold. I was the the person of color involved in that. You know, there were no other um, brown or black people on the the middle grade um, bestseller list at that time. So, I feel like that was the only option commercially back Mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. But I think I was able to, I think if I had written a Brown character feeling ugly, Mm. feeling Mm. off, I would have had a hard time. It would have been too close. 
It would have been too close. I think I could do it now, but I don't know because I feel like I'm past that. You know, I'm past that, so I don't. I wouldn't want to go back back to it. But I think I needed to make it a white girl in order to fully <laughs> fully be able to express those feelings without sort of the going into a too dark a hole about it. Well, also know? that if it or, was a a girl of color who who it is in the in this in the movie. Yes, yes, yes. But yeah. to write it as a girl of color who looks in the mirror and sees herself as ugly is different. It's and you're adding is that become about color and not as much about hundred yeah hundred percent and so that wasn't an option but i think the other interesting thing is in the book there's a scene that's not in the movie but it's the most important scene in the book i think where she tells the she tells the dean of good who's played Mm. like carrie washington in the movie she says she goes the, the dean goes why don't you feel like you belong here why do you feel like your friend who's the beautiful blonde right who acts like a gay man (laughs) <laughs> in the school for evil, ah, you know. Oh my so the, God, the beautiful that changes everything. The, the the beautiful blonde who's statuesque and everyone in love with, who acts entirely like a gay man, mm-hmm. is her best friend, right? So that's my doppelganger, other wow. half shadow. And so she goes to the dean of good and she says, "You know, I don't belong here because I'm not beautiful. Look at me. You know what I mean?" And she goes, "Well, I'm I'm Cinderella's fairy godmother. If you wanted to be beautiful, you should have just asked. I can grant any wish." And so she she goes, you know, close your eyes. I'll make you beautiful. Gives her this huge makeover. And uh, she goes downstairs to look in the mirror. And everyone's reacting to her, being like, you're beautiful. Oh, my God. What, what did they do to you? Look at you. You're amazing. Da, da, da. Mm-hmm. And I went to write the scene. And I remember distinctly where I was in my room. And I was had her about to look in the mirror and see everything that the dean had done to her. And I realized that in that moment that the dean hadn't done anything to her at all. That... It was entirely uh, perception. A ruse. Mm. perception. And but the funny thing was, I had never planned that. I planned for her to have the full makeover, right? Because <laughs> in my head, I needed someone to make me forty pounds of muscle bigger and fix this and change my nose and change that and fix everything. And until I wrote, the, and I remember writing that scene and having these kind of shivers of like, oh shit, like, mm-hmm. like this is it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that it was just this sort of moment. So was that of, that um, must have been tough you know. when you were making the movie because the girl in the movie is actually beautiful from frame one. <laughs> and when people could say you look like a witch and stuff, I'm like, they made her hair a little cuckoo, but otherwise oh, God. she I is know. so oh, gorgeous. Uh, <laughs> the most beautiful. So that's I mean, it's a, it's a little different in that, you know, that that sort of deep self-esteem journey to discover. To, to discover your own inner beauty is it's is harder to play in the movie, not just because of that, but also just structurally, there wasn't as much, you know, sort of room for it. I feel like to me, that was the the thing that a lot, I think made it really successful. The book uh, made the book super successful with a lot of um, readers, male and female, because who doesn't feel that way? Right. Except for, you know, the TikTok, the TikTok gays. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> TikTok I'm case. terrible. I'm terrible. Can but, I ask um, you? I you know, know Chad's journey of growing up because he, you see, he said, "Did you study white people?" Yeah, I would. I but I always went to fairly diverse schools. I mean, okay, which means like maybe thirty percent black. But my classrooms were almost entirely white, and I oh, feel like okay. you know, if you live in this country, you spend you spend a life studying what white people like for sure. Mm. I'm just wondering. For you, if, if you said you lived on an island and you were the only person of color, you were the only brown skinned person that you ever saw, mm. does that, is that kind of like not having a mirror? How do you define yourself as other? Do you have to like constantly check in with the mirror? Do you feel like outside of yourself? I, I live in such a white world. It's so yeah. easy for me to not, to, to never have this question. It's such a good question because I think at that age, you know, if I lived in New York growing up, I think I would have had a totally, yeah, or grown up in India or something. It's a totally different thing. I think it's why whenever I go to India, I feel this complete sense of zen and calm. You, you know? do? Um, oh, 100%. Even though like everything's right, it's total chaos. And it's insane. total I chaos like, there. <laughs> total chaos. Total chaos. But I feel completely calm. Um, I think what ends mm-hmm. up happening is it's so subconscious something happened where, you know, by the time I turned 12 or 13, I just stopped looking in mirrors. And that's Agatha's mm. primary trait mm-hmm. in the School for Good and Evil. Mm-hmm. First time you see her, anytime there's a mirror, she doesn't look at it. And I think that was that was what happened. I think it was just this understanding that, you know, 
I wasn't one of the club. And because I wasn't one of the club, then I was ugly. You know, it was, it was a misunderstanding on my part, but it was a misunderstanding that unfortunately there was not enough information to correct. If wow. I may, like, it's, I think it's probably like, you know, when you had your shoulders hunched and your tailbone sticking out, like, I just came back from um, homecoming for my college, which was an all black mm. college. I didn't know what it was like to take full breaths every day until I went to mm. that college. You know, I wasn't used to like being able to, I'm not a big person, but like just be full until yeah. I was around a bunch of black people and nobody was making me feel squished into a corner. It, does that resonate? Hundred percent. Because also, you you feel like you you're you already have a bunch of demerits against you. You're not white. You, I'm fifty pounds underweight. I'm going through puberty in a very sort of violent, awkward way. So you just feel so off that then you can't actually be yourself either because you're in the closet, and so you can't be vulnerable, right? So like, had I done this interview back then, I would present the most polished, perfect version of myself mm-hmm. where everything was great because. You can't ever be authentic because you already have so many kind of holes, you know? Huh. Um, and so I think you what ends up happening is you create this facade. And that's what I was saying with self-consciousness, where everything is everything is controlled and contrived to elicit a reaction. And to decondition out of that and become your true self takes a long time and a lot of work. I went to, you know, a lot of therapists and stuff who diagnosed me with all kinds of anxiety and depression and OCD and all sorts of issues over the years. But I didn't want to take, I didn't want to medicate myself. I didn't want to, I wanted to figure it out, you know, because I felt like there was, I wanted to figure out how, how to let my creativity out. And I felt like the only way to do that was to go through the fire, whatever that was. Uh, Was that, that, that year of shutting down the the, the year? The year of, that was, that was the, the end of that year was when I finally was sitting in a movie theater and watching, I think I was in India and I was watching um, a movie and I, I remember thinking to myself, oh, I'm going to go to film school. It was like an instant, it was just this sort of change. Like it took a year to sort of reorient. And now I was like, I'm going to film school because, you know, at that time I thought that was what I was going to end up doing, you know, which was uh, writing movies or whatever it was going to be. So you but still hadn't fully the, integrated your silver ball, which is, I mean, that's, it is creative, but you still hadn't fully walked into your shoes as an author, as a writer. No, 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 no. Or I just, as an artist in general, I feel like it t- I needed to go to school to, uh-huh. to have the structure. And then, you know, I had a few years after as a screenwriter, a few projects that didn't get off the ground. And that was sort of the second rock bottom of you have mm-hmm. no money, nothing's happening. Everyone else is in control of your career. Everyone else gets to decide what gets made, you know? And I think that's that's when finally the jack-in-the-box idea of School for Good and Evil popped out being like, well, here's something you can control because it's been waiting for you inside you for 100 years, you know? Is there wow. anything you've learned from um, writing children as characters, speaking to children you know, making art for children. Is there anything about the minds of children that you think societally we misunderstand? I think what we misunderstand is how sophisticated they are and the fact that their brains are more sophisticated than ours. And the complaint I often used to get about School for Good and Evil from whether it was critics or like, you know, when we sent it out on submission we just got that it was too sophisticated. It was too subversive, too ironic. Kids mm. would take it literally. They wouldn't get the humor. They wouldn't get the the dark edge to everything. You know, like um, the princesses like uh, tend to starve themselves in the book and like not eat because they're worried about looking a certain way. And they were like, no, kids are going to read it and want to look like those. And I'm like, they're not. They're going right. to get that it's satire. They're going to get that those those girls are the villains. And I think what I realized is, especially kids these days, they're so ahead of us. They, yeah. they know everything. And so I always write to peak intelligence. And the only time I ever argue with my editor is when she's like, I think this is too much for a kid. And I'm mm. like, it is absolutely not. It's just not. I know what I've been around them. I know what they can handle. And without fail, whenever we have that debate, it's it, that issue never comes up. Mm. It just doesn't. I used to, I loved all the Harry Potter books, but I noticed... Mm that they got longer and longer and longer. Oh, uh, see, that's why I don't ever move on from Tony because she just doesn't care. Okay. Like, she doesn't care how successful the books are. She doesn't care about 
she just doesn't care. Like she just, cause she looked, she edited the greats, you know? And so she's all about the pace and she's always right. You know, she'll just be like, I'm bored. This is taking oh, too long. She'll say like, that. I'm bored. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Tony doesn't mm. care. Like, she'll yeah. just say anything to me, you know? <laughs> just be like... <laughs> so that's, I think, why we have such a good relationship is because I don't take anything personally because I just know she's after the best possible book, which I am too. And so I'm just like, tell me everything. Give me everything. And I'll know what to do. She doesn't, like, there's no solutions, but she'll just be like, I don't get this. I don't know what's happening. This is too long. You know, this section is super boring. And then I'll be able to use that feedback and mm-hmm. toy it. But all my books, I the books obviously got longer, you know, once you got into the series, but I feel like they never got self-indulgent. If you do allow yourself to just go on and on and on, I think you lose, you do lose a lot of readers. You lose some magic. I think that there's some sort of magic in the keeping it tight. There's some, Mm. there's beauty in, uh, you know, they always say, you know, creativity comes out of, a lot of people say it's not everybody, but uh, out of constraint. Like if you're challenged to write a a song using only four words and three notes like that, you're going to get this wild creativity as opposed to just whatever. The secret I use sometimes is I watch the way teenagers read and they're, they read at double, uh, double time, the way we read. And Mm -hmm. so my last step in a book when it's done and I'm just about to finish one and I'll probably start doing this soon is I read it double time. I literally shrink the text on my screen and I just read it super fast. Wait, wait, how can you make yourself read super fast? You just like read it it. like a teenager. You're just like, (laughs) you're just like reading. You're just like speed reading it and you need to be able to follow it. And if it starts to slow down or gets caught in description, you're like, it bumps you. And then, you know, you have to cut that part. It needs to like, especially with these kind of books in this generation, when everything is ADD and insane, it's got to go fast. Everything has to be fast. Julie, I just wanted to ask you the same question. Once you Hmm. got a certain level of validation, you know, did you start, you know, some first time director comes in to direct an episode of Modern Family and you're like, no, 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 Claire doesn't think that's funny or Claire doesn't do that. Like, did you ever get to a point where you you know, where you stood a little more firmly in your artistic point of view because you had reached that level of validation. Well, yes, but being my own insecure self, I would never say it was validation of me. I felt like it was validation of the writers and all the all the work that we'd all done as a team to get to year five, year six, year seven. So that when somebody would come in and be like, so it's going to be really fun if she just like skates into the room this way. And I'd say, um, that doesn't feel right. I felt like I was protecting a whole, that they might be talking to me, but I was defending the team. It is uniquely, uh, you, writing is such a uniquely solo endeavor and acting is so, at least in film and television, is so collaborative. I think it's why I've always really liked it because I've never felt all alone doing it. I've always felt like I could look around and go like, oh, you're doing, you're doing your job. I'm doing my job. We're just It's like parallel play as kids. We're all just doing our jobs. Sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it's but funny. I-, I had the same thought when I was, I was on set and I did this little cameo in the movie and I was at the table with Charlize and Carrie and Lawrence and Michelle. And I was thinking to myself, at the end of the day, what they do in this moment is going to end up on this massive screen with millions of people watching it. Mm-hmm. If I was an actor and actress, I would just feel the Im- immense pressure of, what if I had a breakout that day? What if I'm jet lagged? What like, like the fact that that moment just sort of lives on of your face, giant. I don't know. It it it, it felt like I could understand the intense like pressure that an author never feels because we just a movie comes out, we just hide, you know. Well, there's a reason why it's Kerry Washington and Charlie Stone and Michelle Yeoh <laughs> because they are like the most beautiful women, and mm. that's they, they don't they, they probably don't worry a whole lot about that. I wanted to go back, if I may, to when you came out. To whom did you come out? Was there a, oh, was there a process? Good question. I think what happened was, I maybe had told a friend or two. But I was on the plane home for spring break, my senior year of college, and I was reading a book, I think a, a biography, by a memoir by someone who was gay. And they basically said, if you haven't come out to your parents because you're trying to <clears throat> protect them, you should ask yourself who's helping who. 
And that became uh, uh, later the most important chapter in the School for Good and Evil series, a, a chapter called Who's Helping Who, because mm. that resonated with me. Like, oh, I'm not telling them I'm gay to protect them. Doesn't mm. that ruin their story too? Because what if their life's journey is to have a gay kid and figure it out? I'm basically, right. I'm holding back my story and I'm holding back theirs. So I went home and I wasn't going to tell them, but I think that seated in my head. And again, body revolted. I was in a car with them and I started sweating. I'm not a sweaty person. I started sweating profusely to the point that my shirt was soaked. It was like on the oh car my seat. And my oh mom God. just turned around and she's like, what is happening? And then I think she just knew. She was uh. like, and she just said it. She goes, she said it. Wait. She said it. I think she said something like, she was like, I think I'd been weird the whole trip, but that was the moment where it really, and she was just like, I think she said something like, you can bring home any girl, any girl you choose will be happy with. And then I I just, I don't remember what was going on. I don't remember, like, I feel like I blocked it out, but I just remember her being like, you're gay, aren't you? And I said it. You're not supposed to do it in a car. That The one, number one rule is don't do it in a car. Does that mean that she always knew? <laughs> I don't think she always knew. I think I had brought some friends over a couple of months earlier um, for Christmas. And I think one of the guys I was interested in, and I think she just, I think she had started to put the pieces together. Sometimes when um, people write and speak on Black stuff, I feel mm. like, man, is there anything left like revelatory to say about this? Or is it really just now it's like reaching a, a broader audience? Like in other yeah. words, in other words, saying like, is there anything new I can say about this, or am I just now like reaching white people with it? For yeah, yeah, yeah. for you, do you think there are still yet revelatory things to be said about like the gay experience or coming out or you know anything that would sort of live in that in that world, or do you think it's more just about who has access to it? I think what I'm interested in now, and it, it shows up in my work a lot, is is the idea that we can start to let go of the, these fixed labels. The idea being that like, okay, at some point in your life, you have to declare being gay or coming out of the, oh, you have to declare this. And I think mm. the new kind of kids growing up and in all my books, uh, those words don't exist. Mm. Nor does the idea that you have to ever declare, I only like boys, I only like girls. I, I think it's just more natural for everyone to just have their experience and who they're attracted to at any given time and not feel like that's going to define them for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. Yes, they may only exclusively be attracted to men forever, but let them discover that in the present, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. Rather right. than having to come out as X with this word that's going to follow them around. And I feel like that's what I'm after in my work. And I feel like that's kind of what, what Gen Z and the teenagers are after in a lot of their sort of, you know, expressions is that, the idea that identity, and I think that's why we see so many words floating around for identity. Like it used to just be, you could either be yeah. gay, bi, or lesbian, or whatever. Yeah. Now there's a hundred words. And I think it's less about, and people see that as like a doomsday sign or whatever. I see it as the opposite. It's, I think it's ultimately trying to get away from language entirely. Mm. It's like, they're just trying to throw out all these words. So ultimately none of it means anything. Right. Mm -hmm. And we right. can all, and we can all just be who we are in a given moment. I, I want to apologize for, for, forcing you, if I did in my language, forcing you into a box of whatever label I was putting on it. Oh, not at all. I, I mean, I'm just I, very I interested in, it. you're somebody who you live so fully from your body and mm. to be at odds, even your most spiritual moments, your most creative moments come from your body. And mm -hmm. then your body is used for lots of things, for sports and for sleeping and for sex. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sex is important. And to be at odds with your body or your body's desires must have been difficult. And, and I, I'm always trying to find out what, what makes people want to stop that contradiction in their lives. So my apologies if I forced no, you into no, no. a box. No, no, no. I think, no, because ultimately that moment of having to say that was the beginning of freedom. So I think mm. I never, like, Whereas I think some people now, as they're younger, might sort of like not want to be pinned in that box. I needed that box to, mm. to escape, you know? So like me having to say it out loud was the beginning of freedom. I don't think I ever would have said it had that not, you know, that sort of just come from inside where it just felt like the time that 
it just felt like the right time to to go through it. And it was a process and it took a long time. And, you know, I feel like a late bloomer in a lot of ways, but I think ultimately creatively and personally and romantically and all those things, I'm finally starting to like feel like who I was supposed to be. It just With the goat really farmer? <laughs> With a goat farmer. I'll be moving uh, pretty much to St. Louis in February. No. Wow. Wait a minute. I swear. Wait a what? minute. I'll what? be there like a few weeks a month and back in New York, you know, a, a week, 10 days a month, something like that. He and can't I'll be, leave the goats for long, I guess. He can't leave the goats. I'll be going between, I'll have a place downtown and then going out to the farm. And, um, you know, I'll tell you two funny stories. One was, um, we, I tried to get, I tried to dump him <laughs> because I couldn't do long distance. <laughs> uh-huh. And it was a rainy day in New York and it was storming. And I was on the phone. His name's Scotty. And I was on the phone being like, I can't do this. Like, stop calling me. Better, I need to go on with my life. I, you know, I'm going to find someone in New York, everything, whatever. And I argue and it's storming, storming. And I'm trying to hang up the phone. And on the middle of the street is a big, I wish I could send it to you guys and show it to you. It was a big, like poster piece of paper that just said Scotty in big letters. <laughs> no, no, of, no, that's not, no. Wait a minute. I have like, a picture of it too. It um, was I'll raining it you. and in the middle of the raining. street, in the a middle big, of the street. It just says Scott, and you were still on the phone. It just says Scott. I'm still on the phone. So I literally tilt it down to him, and he goes, Are you still gonna argue? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, No. So that was sign number one. And after that, Ooh. weirdly enough, because I follow signs and all that stuff, I just I I accepted it. Three weeks later, he tried to get rid of me because we had a fight about something. His dad had a heart attack the next morning. And the first thing he did was call me. Because he had stopped right. calling me for a couple of days. Like he was basically giving me the silent treatment and he called me. So we decided that anytime we try to get rid of each other, something terrible, something very dramatic happens. And it's just, you know, those were the two signs. And ever since then, we just sort of gave up on, on resisting it. I have one last question. You talked about this book being within you, this idea of this creative self that you were not in touch with for a long time that you needed to make space and be quiet for that to come through you because it was always there. And now you're talking about sort of uh, fatalistic in a good way, you know, being with your, your partner. Do you believe in fate? Do you believe that, that things are going to happen a certain way? I think in the School for Good Evil world, there's a pen called The Story and mm-hmm. that writes the stories of the world. And I think I, that's my personal religion in the idea that there is a story to be told that your soul should hook on to. And the question is whether you're on the path or you're off. Mm. And if you surrender to the story, it's going to take you where it should go. If you fight the story, then, you know, then your the body's bad stuff in revolution. Starts your, no, your shoulders are up, your back is out, you're sweating to death. And then, then you start making bad decisions. And so to me, it's, can you get back onto the path? And sure, the path is going to have some bad things happening all the time, but at least you're going to be reacting in the moment as yourself, and you're not going to be fighting it with sort of figments of the past. So then what's a bad decision? Is it anyone that then takes you further astray from the path? I think a bad decision is just doing something that's against what your gut you know, what you really believe should be done. And I think if you're really in tune with yourself, you know, when you've done something out of, uh, from your, like your brain and not from that sort of like chest feeling of, you know, you're not, yep. you're, you're doing something against it and you can feel it. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're, you, if you're in, uh, in tune, you know, when you're, when you're off, when you're making a decision for the wrong reason. Well, thank you so much. I was like, I'm not sure where we're going to go for, for the quitting theme. And boy, you are just a rich, rich vein of quitting. All <laughs> You kinds guys of are things. the best. <laughs> no, I feel like now, uh, now I want to hang out with you guys. No, it was, please. I just feel like it was, I was so excited to do it because I feel like, especially these past few weeks, all anybody wants to talk about is the successes. And I'm like, I feel like my entire life is like been one mess after the other mm. that sort of gradually leads you to, something better, well, you know? So that's well, we're sort of excited fun. for your successes as well. <laughs> that it, but it is exactly, you just bore out the entire theme of this podcast, which <laughs> is you have to get rid of some stuff to make way for the successes. 100%. And that's what quitting, good quitting is really all about. 
So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for doing this. Thank you so much.